أعزائي المشاهدين مرحبا بكم في حلقة جديدة من برنامجنا Medical Talk حلقتنا اليوم عن Erectile Dysfunction وال Safety of Drugs that are used in the treatment of Erectile Dysfunction My guest is Dr. Ali Dabaja He is one of the senior staff faculty at Henry Ford Urology Department He finished his medical school at Wayne State University in the state of Michigan in the United States and then he did a fellowship training in uh, treatment of erectile dysfunction and, and infertility at Well Cornell Medical College in uh, New York. Dr. Ali Dabaja, marhaba bik fi hada al barnamaj. Thank you, Dr. Alani, shukran ala al barnamaj wa ala wa um, Dr. Ali Dabaja, we know that erectile dysfunction is a very important problem here in the United States. Uh, according to some statistics that are available to us, um, about 18 million people are affected by this disease in the United States. Uh, many of patients with diabetes uh, suffer from erectile dysfunction, and about maybe 90% of patients with erectile dysfunction have at least one risk factor to develop a major cardiac event in the future. Um, what is your definition for erectile dysfunction? Well, uh, patients with erectile dysfunction, when they present to you to the clinic, they usually uh, present to you with anxiety, uh, they're, uh, they're um, having some, uh, you know, they're shy about the symptoms. But the major two complaints that they have is that they are having difficulty obtaining an erection that is hard enough for intercourse, or they do get erections, however, they lose their erection during intercourse. And so they might not upfront tell you that when they present to your clinic because they're having difficulty uh, articulating that. And so they come in with vague complaints, and usually you have to uh, help the patient to articulate the problem. Okay. How do you measure erectile dysfunction? Let's say, so let's say this patient comes to you and say, I'm having this problem. Mm -hmm. What are the questions that you're going to ask this patient in clinic to, uh, to basically measure the severity of the problem? So first I, uh, you know, I try to understand what kind of problem they're having. Uh, I try to under, uh, do a full history. When did it start? How, um, how are they describing it? Then I do an exam, try to look for clues of what is, could be causing some of their pro uh, problem with erections. And after uh, doing that, I actually uh, do some simple blood work just to assess their overall health, uh, uh, screen for things such as diabetes, uh, blood pressure, uh, as well as a screen for hyperlipidemia. And then from there, based on, on the, the information, I also look and see if they have a hormonal problem and then uh, to have a discussion with the patient based on the risk factors. I understand. So why would patients with diabetes develop erectile dysfunction? Well, a lot of these chronic conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, can lead to uh, vascular problem, nerve problems, uh, that is the, the vascular uh, supply to the penile shaft might be damaged or the nerve ending might be damaged. Just like any other organ, like the kidneys or the, vi the, the, the sensations in the hand can uh, lead, uh, you know, be affected by diabetes, similarly with erectile function. Okay. So if you have somebody who has diabetes, at what age or after how many years of being diabetic do you expect that, pro that patient to start developing the problem with erectile dysfunction? It's, uh, you know, it's variable. Every patient's different. And so every patient will present to you with different complaint and different uh, conditions. So you have to uh, take the patient in perspective and, when, you know, and look at the all other conditions that they have. But usually it's, um, you know, they might present to you with erectile dysfunction and they've never been diagnosed with diabetes and you have to be a, a alert for that. Got it. Yeah. Besides diabetes, what are the other risk factors for erectile dysfunction? Well, uh, let's, let's review what some of the causes of erectile dysfunction. Okay. Uh, the causes of erectile dysfunction include uh, vascular causes, as we were alluding to earlier, okay. uh, there are nerve ending problems such as, uh, you know, n nerve injury due to spinal cord injury or uh, certain diseases that can affect the nerves. Uh, there are uh, hormonal problems uh, such as testosterone level and other hormones that can affect the erectile function. And there are causes due to medication, for example, patients who have been treated for blood pressure uh, uh, to control their blood pressure. Uh, the, the, some of the medication can cause erectile dysfunction, so you have to be uh, con cognizant of that. 
And anxiety and depression and some, some psychological causes uh, can lead to erectile dysfunction. So we look at all of those things and we review all those with the patient, try to understand the condition that they have, especially when they come see me at Honeyford Health System. I actually do all those things and be able to understand their overall health and try to improve their health to lead to improvement of their uh, sexual function. Okay. So you mentioned that you, when you see the patient, you ask them about these risk factors, and then you test, you do mm -hmm. some testing to make sure that the, to basically investigate other causes for erectile dysfunction. Is there any kind of invasive or imaging testing that could help you besides the simple questions and the history that you ask this patient? Is there something that you otherwise do in clinic to investigate erectile dysfunction? Sure. Uh, we we do very minimal invasive testing. We you know a lot of it is. Uh, understanding what the patient is um, having. Uh, after obtaining a history and, and understanding the patient, after obtaining their risk factors and blood tests for hormonal testing, we usually uh, can start treatment immediately without doing any uh, invasive testing. There's no need for invasive testing. And some of the treatments range from um, tr uh, pills uh, to other things that might progress down the road. Yeah. Before you, start, before you start patients on any treatment, let's say so you have that diabetic patient or you have this patient with cardiovascular disorders, are, is there a group of patients where you'd say, well, look, your, your diabetes or your cardiovascular problems, your heart problems are so severe to the point that I'd like you to see a cardiologist before I can start treating you? Oh, that's a very good question, Dr. Alani. So basically, what I usually do for these patients is that after I have assessed their risk factors, I see if they are fit to be sexually active. And if they are, I will treat them with, for their erectile dysfunction. If they're not fit to be sexually active, I usually do have them see their primary care physician or a cardiologist in some instances to better assess their uh, overall health and improve their overall health so they can be sexually active. This month, this month is the National Drug Safety Month here in the United States, and the question to you is, so let's say I'm a patient who have a cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. and let's say somebody gave me one of those medications, for example, Viagra, the medications sure. that are being used sure. to treat yeah. the, uh, blue pill. the blue pill. Yes. So I'm giving that drug to use at home. Are there any signs or symptoms before getting to you? Are there any, any signs or symptoms that I can watch out for and judge based on those signs and symptoms that if I use this blue pill, mm -hmm. that I'm gonna develop a cardiac event. It's like simple, simple signs and symptoms. So yeah, uh, before we give the medication any of these medica uh, any uh, be so before we give the patients or any of these medications, what I usually do is make sure that they can handle these medications. So I ask them, can you walk around the block? Can you walk two flight of stairs with no chest pain and shortness of breath? If they can do those things, usually they can tolerate the pill. And so uh, if they have symptoms after taking the medication, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, then I ask them to stop taking the medication and come back and see me in the clinic. Okay. If the chest pain doesn't go away, I ask them to go to the emergency room, just because some, some of these conditions can be serious. And uh, in general, uh, these medications are pretty safe to take. If I'm, if, I'm a car, if I'm a patient with a cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm and I was treated before for cardiovascular disease. What is the period of time, for example, between me, that we have a lot of patients who come into clinic who have stents placed. Yes. So if I had my stents placed and I'm doing very well, mm -hmm. how, what is the period of time between my treatment and me feeling very well, not having any pain, and you saying, well, you're good enough to go on this treatment? Usually within a month after being treated for a heart attack or let's say a cardiovascular event of any kind, if their symptoms are stable, they can probably safely start the medication. Okay. And it, it really depends, it's individualized. It's based on the patient, it's based on the condition that they have. Uh, relatively, um, you know, within a month of treatment, that should be okay. You should be safe, okay. Between combining those medications, combining the blue pill or combining any of these pills for erectile dysfunction, is there a medication that is a medication for hypertension or a medication for cardiovascular disorder that should not be combined with these erectile dysfunction medications? It's an amazing question. So when we, uh, when we prescribe some of these medications to treat erectile dysfunction, they're called PD-5 inhibitors. Okay. Uh, you know, they're a class of drugs that that are used to treat uh, erectile dysfunction. When we prescribe these medications to the, to the patient, 
uh, we actually review to make sure there's no other medications that can interact with these pills, such as uh, nitrogen-based medications or alpha blockers. Um, so we do, 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 do our due diligence uh, when we see these patients at our clinic to make sure that there will be no interaction. Okay. And as I said earlier, they're just really safe drug overall to be taken uh, if you're having problem, and they're very effective. Okay. Um, in, in general. Now, when I, uh, when I talk to my patients about these medications, I tell them to take them on an empty stomach okay. as, as the, that's how they work the best. Okay. Okay. In that class of medications, so Viagra is the well-known medication that we use to treat erectile dysfunction. Why would Viagra treat erectile dysfunction? What is the, like, what is the mechanism of action? Why sure. would that drug fix that problem? Well, you know, as we said earlier, uh, we, uh, we, a lot of those, um, problems do, uh, that can cause erectile dysfunction limits the blood flow or there is some vascular problem that cause uh, the patient not to have good blood flow. And so a lot of the drugs that we use uh, do increase the blood flow to the penile shaft and it lead to uh, erectile function. Erectile function. Besides Viagra, what other pills or what other drugs within that same class of medication do you usually use? So not to be thrown out commercials for all these <laughs> <laughs> drug yeah. companies, but there's Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and uh, those are the most common ones uh, and, uh, that we, ut we utilize to treat uh, erectile dysfunction. Now, there's things that are not pill-based, and those also can be used. For treatment. What's the difference? Why would you give somebody Viagra versus Cialis versus the other medication versus Levitra? Currently, there are no good studies that showed that one of these drugs is better than the other. Therefore, we utilize them uh, in, basically uh, interchangeably. Uh, however, some of them might last in your system, in your body a little bit more than others, such as Cialis. Uh, therefore, patients might you think, believe that uh, it might, they might have more spontaneous erections when they take Cialis, uh -huh. and therefore, therefore they, they have some preference to, for that. For using Cialis mm -hmm. over, over using Viagra. Yeah, however, the efficacy, uh, that is how effective they are, there's no difference in, in, in between the drugs. Okay. You mentioned that those drugs are safe medications, and you, you mentioned that you're going to be screening those patients for cardiovascular disorders. You're going to make sure that your heart can mm -hmm. actually tolerate sexual activity. What are some of the common side effects for these drugs? And what are the side effects that you want the patients to act to know about? And if they develop these side effects, to stop taking those drugs? Well, uh, we talked earlier about chest pain and shortness of breath. We talked about, uh, uh, you know, if these th things happen, they should uh, stop taking the medication. There are also less severe side effects, such as uh, visual changes. Uh, they might have also some dyspepsia, meaning that they might have some uh, heartburn, flushiness, uh, uh, palpitation. A lot of those things are not severe, and then if they develop these symptoms, they can just stop the medication and the s side effects will go away. They will disappear. Disappear. Got it. So if you have a patient who you've treated with these medications and he's not benefiting from these drugs, What's your next step? What's your next go-to treatment? So yeah, after uh, taking, after prescribing these medications to uh, to treat erectile dysfunction, if they don't work, we usually re-educate the patient about the use. The most common, uh, the most common reason why these medications don't work is that the patient is not taking them correctly. So basically, I sit down with the patient when they come back to my clinic. I talk to them about you know the use and how they should be utilized. Uh, as we talked about earlier, they should be taken on an empty stomach. If that does not work, then there are other treatments such as injection medications, just like insulin, how you inject yourself with insulin to mm -hmm. uh, treat diabetes. Okay. Those medications can be used very similarly, uh, there's, uh, where you inject yourself to get erections. And then there are other things such as surgeries that we do, and that, uh, that, and that in itself can be helpful. Okay. So you, so you mentioned injections. Mm -hmm. So for the injections, like what's the process? So this patient is coming in, he's saying, or this patient has tried the pills, the pills are not working for this patient, and he comes in to receive those injections in clinic. What is your, what is your pathway? How do you guys train those patients to do the injections? Does the patient keep the material for the injections at home? Are they safe to keep at home? How, how do we do that treatment? So Dr. Alani, when these patients come to us at Honey Ford, what we usually do after they have failed the pills is that I uh, set them up for teaching session of how to inject themselves. Uh, 
So they have a couple of teaching sessions with my staff or myself. We teach them how to inject themselves with the medication. The medication for injections are very, very effective. And a lot of the patients who actually use them are very happy with the results. So I uh, teach them how to use them. They take the medication home and they utilize them at home uh, as they wish. And uh, if they have any problem, they come back and see us. So. Going back to that, the, to a, the um, drug safety theme. So you said that those injections are very, very effective. They are more effective than the pills. Mm -hmm. Do they have more side effects than the pills? Um, they do have some side effects, and those side effects are more localized. They're, they're because you're giving the medication to the area, and therefore uh, the patient will have less less general side effects, and okay. the side effects will be you know, prolonged erections. Okay. Some might think that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is one thing that could happen, and so that could be an emergency. Bruising at the site of the injection is a common side effect, as well as some scarring or some uh, problem where you might have developed some changes to the penile shaft that usually patients will complain of. So, you mentioned prolonged erection. Well, how, how do you define a prolonged erection? So the patient took Took that, do, you, do patients develop prolonged erection also with the pills, or is this just uh, specific to the injections? You know, uh, I get asked that all the time uh, by my patients. It is n reported to be a side effect. We don't see it as often okay. with the pills. However, okay. with the injections, there are some side effects that you, uh, where you can get prolonged erections. Okay. And if they do have those prolonged erections, what I tell my patients is to come back and see me in clinic or to go to the emergency room. And a prolonged erection is defined as an erection that lasts longer than four hours okay. with pain. With so pain. if they develop pain, that's the key there. And you have to go to the emergency room. Okay. You treated those patients with pills. Mm -hmm. You treat, so some patients, you treat them with injections. What if, I, what if the patient what if the patient was too hesitant to do the injection treatment at home? Yeah. Are there any other options that are short of surgery, that's before surgery, that could be used in this situation, in somebody who failed treatment with, um, with the pills? That's a very good question. So they do, you know, every now and then are shy of needles. You know, patients don't like needles. I don't, I'm a physician, and I <laughs> don't like needles myself. But, you know, uh, so, you, you, you can be shy of needles, and then what I usually do is incorporate the partner into the process. Okay. And I bring in the partner and teach the patient how to utilize the partner for the injection. Okay. And that works very well. Uh, then they're, you know, it's, it's into the act, and then they are more uh, likely to uh, do the injections. Okay. However, if they fail injections, there are treatments after that, and those treatments include uh, surgeries to be able to uh, have natural uh, erections okay. uh, that are you know that they can be utilized. Got it. Got it. Cost effectiveness. So when we're talking about cost mm -hmm. and we're talking about the pills and you're talking about the injections, mm -hmm. we come from a community and there is a big immigrant community here in Detroit where people we're all dealing with the health insurance issues. Yes, indeed, it's a problem. It is a big problem. What is between the two treatments? What is more cost effective, is there more treatment, is, is, the, is one of the two treatments more cost effective than the other treatment? What is the average cost? Let's see if I'm a patient and if I'm trying to buy those drugs out of pocket. Mm -hmm. What do you expect the average cost is for um, those so treatments? So different treatments have different costs. The, the pills uh, have, uh, they could be really expensive. However, there are now available uh, generic forms of the pill that are less expensive. And then, uh, I don't want to be throwing out numbers, but it's usually, the p if you do, let's say, the Viagra genera, uh, generic Viagra, sorry, excuse me, uh, that could be around 50 to 100 uh, f month worth of supply. Uh, the injections uh, also are uh, not that expensive relative to the pills, okay. and they can be run in the same range, fifty to a hundred dollars worth month, worth one month of supplies. Uh, it is very problematic, uh, you know, where the a lot of insurance companies don't cover these medications, mm -hmm. and I, I I look at that in a way that it is. Um, you know, it, it is, does put the, uh, the man at disadvantage who have this problem. Okay. Coming from a Middle Eastern community, what do you think are the barriers to treat, to diagnose and treat 
erectile dysfunction. What do you what do you see in your daily practice? What yes. do you deal with? No, this is uh, you know and now when I see my patients at Hanu Ford, especially with a Middle Eastern background, it's very hard to get the, the patient to open up and to tell you what the problem is. Usually they are dancing around the issue because just it's just a pride and it's they you know they feel like their manlyhood is being touched, and it's okay. It's a normal feeling to have, and there that's there's nothing wrong with that feeling. And so we try to make you feel comfortable. We try to understand where you're coming from and, and ho handhold you through the process to make sure that you are getting the treatment that you need and make sure that you know, you're back to where you want it to be. Got it. Got it. We're working together on this Arab, Arab American Access Clinic in Henry Ford. Can you tell us, can you uh, expand on what, how you think that this project of the American, uh, Arab American Access to healthcare at Henry Ford, how would that, how would this whole men's health erectile dysfunction is going to fit into the picture? So you and I, Dr. Alani, have the pleasure of working together <laughs> and I enjoy it every single day, as you <laughs> know. Thank you. Uh, you know, we have been planning for this uh, for a long time, to open up access to our Arabic community, uh, to be able to communicate uh, your logical diseases in Arabic to them and explain the treatment for them in Arabic. And, uh, you know, having uh, both of us working uh, on this will allow us to, you know, help our Arabic community understand the disease process, understand the treatment process, and make it more accessible to them. And that's our goal. We're also going to be, as you know, we're going to be having uh, uh, coordinators who speak in Arabic specifically that will coordinate uh, the care. And, you know, you came up with a lot of those great ideas, and it's been a pleasure working with you on this <laughs> Thank one. you, sir. Um, the, Mid the Middle Eastern lifestyle, mm -hmm. so based on the Middle Eastern lifestyle, would you say that the incidence of erectile dysfunction, that the problems with erectile dysfunction are higher or lower compared to the to the usual to the mid like to the Midwestern or to the Detroit lifestyle to the American lifestyle. Yeah, I, I have always been wanted to actually look up more data mm -hmm. on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, because we're under the, our community is underserved med and have less access to medical care, it is probably going to be higher. And the reason is because. Erectile dysfunction is associated with a lot of other chronic diseases. And since these chronic diseases are not being uh, treated properly or not being uh, treated just because there's no access to health care, I can see where erectile dysfunction is very common, but it's probably a taboo where it's not talked about. Because as we talked about earlier, uh, it becomes, you know, um, a pride thing and shy and there's a social barriers there's some uh, you know limitation to access to care due to uh, to cost and so you know it, it is very difficult okay. erectile dysfunction is it is it a problem of the elderly or do you see any young man with erectile dysfunction and if you see a young man with erectile dysfunction would the causes for erectile dysfunction be problem be different so that is a great question. So if a 25-year-old come in with problem with uh, obtaining and maintaining erection okay. versus a 55-year-old, I do view them a little bit differently. Partly because usually a 25-year-old, the cause of erectile dysfunction is most likely due to anxiety to perform. They have uh, stresses in their life. They have changed relationships or they have um, they have, you know, experienced something that caused them to not be able to focus uh, and be able to obtain good erections. And then you have the 55-year-old gentleman who presents to your clinic who, uh, you know, most of the time it might be anxiety, but also, as we talked about earlier in the program, you know, there is chronic diseases that they might have and that can cause them to have these erectile dysfunctions. Supplements, drug supplements. So people use these natural preparations to help, for like male enhancement. Mm -hmm. What do you, what is your view on those male enhancement? Do they work? If they work, are there any specific in male enhancements that do you think are better than others? If they don't, are, do they have any side effects? You know, outside of a daily vitamin, I am. You know, it's very hard to, for me to be able to recommend some of these medications because a lot of them are herbal substances that are not controlled, and we don't know what it's exactly in them. So because of that specific reason, uh, we don't know what is in these medications, and therefore 
we don't know what the side effects will be and what the overall long-term effect from this medication would be. So outside of a daily vitamin, it really a lot of the supplements don't have much uh, effect on sexual function, and they have not been studied very well. Okay. So we can't make recommendations on those uh, supplementations. Supplements that people use for muscle building, mm -hmm. the supplements that contain steroids, anabolic steroids, mm -hmm. good, bad, so um, that's a, you know, we should have another session on this. <laughs> this is actually a big topic. Uh, but that can actually, if you're using anabolic steroids, let's say during your youth age to build muscle, uh, it can affect your uh, testosterone production in the future. And therefore, as we talked about, the testosterone level, if they're low, they can cause erectile dysfunction. And yes, yeah, so the, overall, those can end up uh, causing uh, erectile dysfunction. And you can see that in guys who have used anabolic steroids when they were young, and now they're in their 40s, and their testosterone level have dropped. Okay. How about drug abuse, like cocaine, heroin, any of that? Like, what does drug abuse does to uh, erectile function? Uh, so you know, uh, you know. So a lot of these uh, recreational drugs, uh, the use of them are unhealthy for multiple reasons. However. Uh, they can cause erectile dysfunction, uh, and uh, in, in a way, uh, it, you know, the, as we all know, the utilization or of these recreational drugs, it can be a you know a psychological disease that needs to be treated. And so, when I see uh, those patients in my clinic, I do you know help them uh, to get the help that they need because it is a you know, overall a psychological condition that need to be addressed, uh, especially addiction. And so, um, it, you know, it's, a, it's, it's another discussion we, you know, that we have with the patient about the need for seeking a help for these conditions. The, 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 the last few minutes that we have, I have two questions left for you. The first question is, what is your team, what does your team consist of? Is it just one person's assignment to deal with erectile dysfunction or do you have more people involved? when you see this patient and when you try to treat his uh, erectile dysfunction? So at Honey Ford, we have built a huge team to uh, take care of these patients. Uh, we have, uh, you know, my nursing staff who uh, teach how to inject. Uh, we have uh, a, psych uh, a th sex therapist who walks patients through uh, some of the uh, difficulties that they have. Uh, we have medical assistants that uh, help patients make sure that they have access that they need. And some of our medical assistants do speak Arabic, so we have uh, that as a, as a way to uh, you know, be able to help our Arabic population. And uh, we also have uh, you know, our some of the pharmacy staff uh, who actually uh, dispense the t uh, the, some of the mixtures of medications that need to be, uh, need, uh, need to be uh, utilized for uh, treatment for erectile dysfunction. Any last, any last minute's message about this whole issue to the erectile dysfunction when, you, when you're talking to the Middle Eastern community? So when I, uh, see our, uh, when I see our patients, specifically Arabic American uh, patients, uh, I really try to get them to open up for us. It is not a taboo to have erectile dysfunction. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it might affect your overall health because you're stressed out about it. It might, it might cause you to have depression and it might affect your relationship. So opening up about it, treating it, and make sure that it is being treated correctly uh, is, uh, is the key. And so uh, you open up to your doctor. Let the doctor know exactly what's going on. It is very important to open up to your doctor. Tell, what your doctor, uh, tell your doctor what you're exactly feeling. Okay. Dr. Baja, this was a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you so much for being, us, being with us with this episode. And hopefully we'll, we'll have you come back in the future for more episodes, especially that you're a specialist in erectile dysfunction and you're also a specialist in um, infertility. And, we know coming from the same background that this is that that's also a very very important subject for our viewers thank you thank you so much for being with us today thank you dr alani for hosting us and thank you for the program for hosting us as well thank you so much for uh, listening to us today and uh, in the next few episodes we're going to keep with this theme of drug safety i'm again trying to have uh, or to host a specialist in uh, pediatric medicine to talk about drug safety in um, uh, children and hopefully that will happen next week. So thank you again for listening to us. Thank, thank you, you so much.